Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, I want to thank thank the folks here um, for putting on the conference and uh, allowing us to be a part of it again. Um, um, a special hello from the folks in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, we get a, we're going to head back tonight after the message this evening, and uh, so we can get back for church tomorrow morning. Uh, it's to have that ability to do so because we're only a couple hours away. Um, it's uh, it's really helpful to be able to do that to be able to get back. Um, and I really wish Brother Jordan mentioned what he's going to talk about Sunday morning. And I'm, I told Gus, I was like, I just, we got to cancel now because I got to stay and listen to that. So I said, no, we won't do that. So I, I asked, I asked Alan, I was like, when you post up the videos, do yours and Brother Jordan's from Sunday morning first, so I can get those. And he said, we probably won't. And I said, that's fine, that's fine. It's just a request. I'll, I'll make it known. But I know, I know. It, trust me, I know. So. Uh, well then, I, I guess we'll both learn what you're doing later then. Uh, but uh, I do greatly appreciate you all for, for allowing us to be able to be a part of this. And we look forward to it every year. Um, I know Bruce um, from, from, our, from our group up there, he, he always asks me, once, once we're done and we're, we're back home, he's like, when's the conference in La Follette? Let me know. Because he always loves coming back. And he loves you all so much. He's staying and not going back with us. So uh, there you go. So you, you obviously have, have um, touched Bruce in a way as well to, that he, he, he enjoys coming here. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we had somebody come back that's not been meeting with us for about three years. And, and he walks in the door and I said, guess who's here? He said, Alan Reagan. I said, No. Then he said, Richard Jordan. I said, no. So I felt like I let him down by telling him. It's like I'll just start off and say, okay, guess who's back. But, um, but uh, yeah, and uh, we're, we're grateful that, that, uh, that he feels comfortable and, and can be able to do that. So, um, so um, hello from the folks in Frankfurt. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Um, hello from Delilah. And... Um, I've not had a chance to, to get with her this morning and see how things are going with her mother, but uh, uh, hopefully I will be able to after lunch and we'll go from there. So um, if you've never put on a conference, you don't really think about what it takes to do a conference. And um, um, I'm grateful for the folks that are here, not only to be able to set it up, but the food and everything else that takes place, the men that come here and, 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 and preach. Um, I look forward to this year, uh, this time of year, every, every year as well. So um, we're thankful for you all and uh, uh, keep it going. Um, if you would like to come to Frankfurt, uh, June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd uh, is when we'll have our conference next year. Um, so if you'd like to come to Frankfurt, come to the smallest capital ever apparently because we think we're big, but we're not. Uh, so if, you're in, if you want to come up to Frankfort, Kentucky sometime, you're more than welcome. Um, we've fixed a, a room in our basement, so if anybody wants to come and stay, let us know. Or just show up, all right? Um, <clears throat> but we thank you all for the opportunity to, to have us here. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to start there this morning. <clears throat> and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to take a couple, a look at some verses, and then we're going to move on um, based off of that. And then we're going to build off of some of the things that we talked about last night, and then some of the things that we didn't get to. Um, what I've noticed is it's easier to overplan, and so then there's a lot of verses that uh, that I didn't get to last night, but maybe we may might be able to this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we'll start here in verse 1, says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the, Thessalonians, of, the Thessalonians, of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in, your, in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith 
and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Savior, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Father, we thank you once again for your word. And as we take a look at the patience of hope, uh, may we allow your word to be the thing that we always go to in every situation of life, because in that is where we find hope. And that is where we find assurance. And we thank you for the things that we have through Jesus Christ and the life that we have. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as we take a look at this, this is where we're going to start off. The title of the message is Patience of Hope. And where that comes from is in verse 3. And in, in verse 3 it says, Paul is writing to the folks at Thessalonica and he says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to take some of the things we talked about last night, bring those into our remembrance, and then kind of move forward with that. One of the things that we talked about last night is there's an issue of, of, of an assurance that we see throughout the Old Testament Scriptures and what was it that the Old Testament saints knew and what was the wisdom that the Old Testament saints had of the hope of, uh, of hope was the fact that there is an assurance. And it's based on the fact that God is truthful and God is truthful to His Word. And we found out the Word and what He said is the issue that was constantly brought up over and over and over again. And so then what I want us to think about is as we go through these things, I kind of mentioned a couple things last week, get, or last night. Get, uh, get Genesis chapter 50 in one hand and get, uh, get Hebrews chapter 6 in the other. Um, and Brother Jordan mentioned, mentioned the one in Hebrews last night, and uh, that, was, that was definitely one of them that I had on my list, but that's okay. Um, I didn't get to it, I just ran out of time. And so then we get to remind ourselves of some of these things as well. Genesis chapter 50 and in Hebrews chapter 6. Notice in Genesis chapter 50, <clears throat> verse 22. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 22, it says, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived in 110 years old, or 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children of, Ma uh, of Machir, and the, and the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took, of, took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye, shall, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, what we see here is the main things that I want us to see there in verses 24 and 25. There's this issue that, that, that Joseph's bringing it up and he's saying, I die and God will surely visit you. This is something that, that, that Joseph is telling these folks and he's saying, God, this is something that God's going to do. And the reason that we know that is because of, and he's not only that, but he, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now we talked about the issue last night with Abraham and Isaac and, and the things that's taking place there. There were some promises that God made to Abraham. There were some promises that God made to Isaac. And there's some promises that God made to Jacob. And what Joseph is is reminding them of is here's some things that God has promised and God will surely do it. And what you notice there in verse um, 24 and 25 here, he says, <clears throat> And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Now, what we, what we see here is there's an issue of assurance. There's an assurity. And what, what we're going to be able to see here is, is what is it that he's done? Is it something that he what? He swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
Now, when you go back over to Hebrews chapter 6, and this is, I, I pointed this out a little bit last night, and I want us to, to keep these things in mind as we go through. What we're reading there in, in Genesis chapter 50, we're going to get some more information here in Hebrews chapter 6, and notice in verse 13. You know, there's, you hate to jump in on a verse that starts with four. <laughs> Look at verse 12, verse 11 real quick. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now, when we, when we looked at that last night, and we talked about that, that there is an expected end, and we talked about in Proverbs 23, it says, For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. We, we talked about that and looked at that last night. And what we're seeing here is in verse 11, he says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. So they had some hope that they're looking forward to, but it's not just that, but it's what? There is a full assurance of hope. And that issue of, their, that, that issue of assurance, and there's something that they know that they can have because of something. And it's not just an assurance of hope, it's an assurance of hope unto the end. And it's that same end that we talked about last night. Verse 12, That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, what we're dealing with this morning is that connection between patience and hope. And we talked about last night, hope isn't just, I hope something happens, right? What are the chances of it happening? Can we increase the chances by me hoping that it happens? That's not what that is, right? This is, this is something completely different. There's an assurance to it. There's something that's expected, and we know that it's going to take place. They had something like that. We do too. And notice verse 13. For when God made, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no, by no greater, he swear by himself. And that should remind us of what we thought about and looked at in, in Titus chapter 1 last night. Who was it that God promised that He was going to give eternal life before the foundation of the world? Was Himself. The one that says, I'm going to swear by no greater because He can't. He swear by Himself. And it's a promise that He's making to Himself to fulfill something. And what happens is, is He gives that same type of promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now that's something that we know that what God's doing, He's going to reclaim the earth with those folks. And of course, we start thinking about why is it that God's doing things that He's doing today? And of course, we know and understand it's not just that God's going to reclaim the earth one day, but God's going to also reclaim the heavens. And that's part of the promise and the hope that we have before us as well. And, and, and what happens is when we start thinking about how is it that we should live our lives in light of that, is some, because if we know that something is going to take place, and the one that's going to make sure it takes place is the one that can swear by none greater and he can swear to himself and the fact that he says, I'm going to do something and he says, by the way, you get to be a part of it if you want to or not. And then we by faith look at what Christ has done and at the moment that we trust in what Christ has done, the fact that He died for our sins, that He was buried and rose again, the fact that He gave us eternal life, something that He promised to Himself that He's going to give to whoever trusts in the death, run, and resurrection of Christ. And we look at His life and say, this was His life. When you look at the life of Christ, His life was completely and totally built on and, and, and foundation of the Scriptures. Amen. Everything. Amen. Everything he did was because of scriptures, and because he said this verse. And you look at you look at those things, and it, he's thinking of the verses all the time. He lived his life in light of that scripture. This verse needs to be fulfilled. What's he do? He does what he needs to do to fulfill it. And he goes to the cross, knowing what Psalm twenty-two says. And that's why he's quoting Psalm 22, and his entire life was based on that. And you take a look at that and say, well, 
how can I do that? Well, you find out what God's doing, go do that. Amen. Well, is He trying to reclaim the earth through Israel? And should we go bless the nation of Israel in this time of their trouble and all the stuff that they're going through so that God would one day look at us and say, come in to the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world? And the answer is no. But if we think that's who we are, if we think that's what we're supposed to be doing, we're going to be miss. We're going to we're going to mess. We're going to mess the. Pro, we're going to mess it up. But it's God's assurance that we're that we should get back to. And so then, when we think about these things, this is the issue. Notice in verse fourteen, saying, "Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee." And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by, by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the, the immutability of His counsel, confirming it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. And we looked at that last night. There's, there's a... There's a whole issue that, that, that folks say, well, there's, there's nothing God can't do. Well, what's that verse right there tell us? It's impossible for God to lie. Amen. So you start thinking about those things. And in Titus 1, it says he cannot lie. But there's, there's two issues there that we see. And what I want us to think about is, and the question comes up, is God finished with Israel? No. So what do we know about the things that God's promised to them? It will come to pass. All right? So when we think about these and go through this stuff, notice he says in verse 18 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, and that's his counsel and the oath there, we might have a strong consolation. We have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. There they, they have a hope to look forward to, which hope we have an, an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is, is for us, entered even Jesus, made a, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now you stop and you think about that. If you go through and you say, Paul wrote Hebrews, what have you just made us there in Hebrews chapter 6? There's a problem there, right? But, do they have a promise? Yes. Is God going to fulfill that promise? Yes. Did God make a promise to us? Absolutely. Now, let's go back real quick. Get, uh, get Psalm 27, because I want to make some connections here. Psalm 27. <clears throat> And these will, be, these will be fairly quickly. So get Psalm 27, Psalm 37, and Psalm 62. Psalm 27, Psalm 37, and Psalm 62. <clears throat> and there's some other ones we could get to and go through. But I want us to see these connections, then we'll, we'll go take a look at some stuff for us and see how far we get. Psalm 27. <clears throat> Notice here, verse 14. This is a psalm from David, obviously. Verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. When we start thinking about this issue of patience and hope, when we look at this, what do we find out here? He says what? Wait on the Lord. Now, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. What's that very first word? Rest. Rest. Where? When we go through and you read Romans 5 and other passages as well, I've often said 
Read Romans 5, and if you really believe it, just try to be in a bad mood. Read Romans 8, and if you really believe it, just try to be in a bad mood. Because if, if, that, if that doesn't let us know, here's the rest. Just rest in what Christ has done. Is this something that David had? What we're talking about in Romans 5, is this something that David had? Did he have Romans 5 to go to? No. Did they have a rest, though? Yes. Where is their rest? The same place ours is. Amen. And you look at this, it says, Rest in the Lord, and what? Wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. What is it that they're looking to inherit? They're looking to inherit an earth. What is it that he tells them that they need to do? Wait. Wait. And then he's going to give. Now here's the difference. We've already got. And he says, because we've already got, what can we do? Wait. And we'll see that, right? This is, this is something slightly different, right? This is, I've always said it this way. What, what the nation of Israel's going to get, as far as... You know, you go through Romans, and in Romans chapter 9, Paul brings up, well, what about Israel? What about their covenants? What about the promises? What about the things that they have? What about their inheritance? Why? Because the first eight chapters he's told us, or from chapter 4 up to, to that point, he's telling us about the things that he's promised us, the things that we look forward to, the things that we have, our inheritance, and things like that. Does that disannul what God's doing with the nation of Israel? And the answer is absolutely not. And that's why you've got Romans 9, 10, and 11 there that explain that. So when we see this, there's something that they're looking forward to. And notice verse 10, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Do we remember where that verse is quoted? Sermon on the Mount. Who is it that Jesus Christ is speaking to there? He's taking them back to this point, reminding them, this is, this is something that you have out in the future. Now, we looked at that last night and we asked the question, well, could you imagine being, a na being part of the nation of Israel, specifically the little flock, and all of a sudden, what you know from Daniel is no longer taking place right now? Are you stopping to think about that sometimes? God's paused what He was doing for a particular purpose. And it's really interesting. We go through... God does that a lot throughout Scriptures. Jesus Christ does it multiple times in His ministry. Um, he goes to heal Jairus's. Well, he go, He's going and he's, he, he's going to go and heal Jairus' daughter. There's also a time where, he, where, where he's on his way to go see Lazarus and what happens? He pauses, he does something for a specific reason, and then he continues on. What's that showing the nation of Israel? Is God going to complete what He's promised to them even though He's paused something? Yes. And so then what they should be able to do is look at those things and say, we know exactly what's going on. Psalm 62. Psalm, cha Psalm chapter 62, <clears throat> verse 1. Psalm 62, verse 1. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from Him cometh, fr from Him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Paul brings up an issue of standing fast. That's not being moved based on, the, based on some truth that we know. Verse 5, My soul waiteth thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. 
Why is it that, that David says that he's not going to be moved is because of what? He knows something that God has promised and God is the one who is going to fulfill that expectation and it's His assurance and He does it based on the Word. And we can go and read that. And we talked about that last night in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Why were those things? Why is it important for us to go back and study those things? Is because those, written, those things that were written before time were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of, of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now, when we look at hope, there's a, there's a connection here with waiting and the patience and, and, and the comfort that we see there and that hope. Now, go back over to Titus chapter <clears throat> Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3, verse 4. Start in verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But there's something after there's a, there's a timing issue here. It says, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward, all, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of Eternal life. Amen. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm how much? Constantly. constantly. We've heard this message before. What's Paul say? Affirm it constantly. We cannot be reminded too much about this. And he's saying this information about the fact that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life, the, the eternal life that we read about in Titus 1 last night. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will. This is something Paul is saying, I, 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 I am willing that. I want this to be affirmed constantly. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And then he goes on and says, don't do these things. Now, when we think about this, there is a hope of eternal life. But there's, and I know there's, there's a bunch more hope that we're going to take a look at this weekend. But this is something that we have, and that's that Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. There's something there. Now, there's something else that we see here in Thess uh, Thessal uh, Thessalonica. Go to 1 Thessalonians real quick. First Thessalonians and, and, and you stop and you think about this. Brother Jordan mentioned last night about the last days and how the last days that Paul's talking about is different than the last days that Peter was talking about, and that's something that we know. And I want you to stop and think about this. When when Paul when Paul's saved, what is it that Peter and those guys are preaching? And there's some things that are going to take place in the last days. And so then one of the first things that, 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 that needs to come out is what? Those last days are put on hold. And you think what's being taught a lot about is those last days is what they're going through. 
When somebody comes up and says, the last days of Timothy and the last days that we see over there is the same last days that we see over here and the same last days that we see in Matthew 24. Think about those things. This is something that the folks in Thessalonica struggled with because there are some people that were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And we see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says what? Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. There is an issue there that we see the work of faith. That's not working. That's not what people do with that is they'll say faith's a work based off that. Well... That's not what he's talking about there. There's a work that faith will produce. If we, if we, by faith, allow God's Word to produce in us exactly what God's designed it to produce in us, what's it going to produce? The work. By the way, it's a good work. And when we think of good, one of the things I always think about, you go back to Genesis and God says day one that it's what? Good, And it matches the pattern, the blueprint that He created. And, and, and He set that up. And when we, when we produce the good works, it's not us producing it. It's the Word producing it. And the work that is produced by the Word matches the pattern that He has set for it. Amen. Because it's good work. It ma and it, His Word will produce it exactly the way He wants it. It's going to be precise to that, to that blueprint, Amen. to that pattern that He's created. And when we do it, it's not. Right. And what we see here is there is a work that their faith was producing. Faith in what? God's Word. And labor of love. The love that they had produced some labor. Paul, this reminds me of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, he's talking about the, the folks that saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection. And, and he's talking about, I'm, I labored more abundantly than they all. Because of why? It was His grace. And you're like, it's not Paul boasting, look at the stuff I've done. It's Paul boasting about the grace that's produced that. Amen, yes. And, it's, and it's, it's God's Word producing that in Paul. And when Paul says, look at me as your pattern, what can we do? How did he behave himself? We see here in Thessalonians how he behaved himself. He tells them, here's how I behaved myself. How did he behave himself? How did Paul, Savanus, and Timotheus behave themselves? They behaved themselves what? How? They believed the verses. Amen. And it produced. And people saw it. And he says, you were witnesses and God also. How holily and, might and, and justly and un... un, un Holy, justly, and unblameably. You know, Brother Jordan was talking about COVID brain last night. I had it. But it, it's frustrating when you see a sentence and you get to a word and that sentence, that word's not there. You can see it in your brain. Here's the sentence. You get there and it's like, I have no idea. It's just this blank, but... What we see here is then he, he ends off with what? And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Savior. Well, <clears throat> turn over real quick to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice here in verse 3. We are bound to give thank to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all the pers in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now when you look at that, you see faith and charity. But what are we missing? 
hope. Now, did they lose that hope because they weren't enduring? That they because they didn't they didn't follow through and they no. What happens is you go to you go to chapter two. Notice in chapter two. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, I know Brother Jordan's going to talk about that, but here's what I want us to think about. What do we notice here? There's something that people have spoken. There are some things that people have written letters to say what? This is from Paul, and Paul is saying, we're going to go through it, guys. But here's the problem. Didn't he tell them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that there's this issue that we're going to be caught away at the end of the dispensation of grace, and what he's doing is somebody's come along and they've taken that and said, that's not going to happen, and they've written it as if it's from Paul. Now what's interesting, go real quick to 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we look here at verse 15. Passage of Scripture we all know and, and understand, hopefully. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shall shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now Hymenaeus and Philetus, what is it that they've done? And the real interesting thing about this is when you go through and you talk about rightly dividing, it's about putting things in the right position. And so then what happens is, is notice verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred. Is Hymenaeus and Philetus denying that the rapture is going to take place? No. No. But how is it that they've erred? They've moved the timing of it. They've said, it's not out there. We've already missed it. It's passed already. And so one of the things I've been looking at over the past couple of years or so is, is how folks take truth and they move it just a little bit. And what's it, what's it done to these folks here? Overthrow the faith of some. And you look at that, and you, you, take issues, you take issues like, when did the church, the body of Christ, begin? Well, we know it's in Acts 9. Some people say it's Acts 2. What have you just done with the beginning of the church, the body of Christ? You've moved it. What's that going to do? It's going to overthrow the faith of some. Well, it didn't start until Acts 28. Again, you've taken a truth. You've not denied the truth. You've moved it. What's that, what's that going to do? That's a mess. You take, resurrect, or you take the rapture of the church. If you take the rapture of the church and move it from pre-trib to anything else, what are you going to do? You're going to overthrow the faith of some. You take that, you move it out here, or you move it out here. That's what these guys were doing. They're changing the timing of things. When you go through and you study through Scripture, one of the things I've, I've, I've done is look at timing words, timing elements. You, you can gauge some stuff. What are these, what are these guys done? If they've taken this thing that is part of their hope... And they've moved it and said what? You don't have it anymore. Now, I don't know if Hymenaeus and Philetus or some of those guys that are writing letters pretending to be Paul, but at least they were teaching that. And what happens is, is that information gets back to the Thessalonians. And what happens is, is you could, I could almost imagine what they're doing is 
Well, these last days and our last days are the same. What have they just done with the last days? They've not allowed them to be where they're supposed to be. They're changing the timing of it and making them the same. And it's going to create a problem. That's what it's done with the folks here in Thessalonica. And that's why Paul has to remind them in, 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 in 2 Thessalonians, it's still coming. What was promised, go, go real quick to, to first, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is, as it is with you, and that ye may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But... The Lord is faithful. Who shall what? Establish you. And you, you say, look at what's going on. Look at the stuff around you. We're seeing Bible prophecy being fulfilled right now. The other day in class, a kid was asking me. He said, so do you think what we're seeing now with Israel is Matthew 24? I said, no. By the way, when was the last time that they've ever had peace? <laughs> they've not. You ever play that game, Risk, board game? If you've got about eight hours to kill... <laughs> Because it takes a long time to play. It, and it's the way that they've got the board set up. But it, it's, 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 it's the map of the world. And you've got different people that are playing different countries and all that stuff. What I've noticed is every time we've played that game, right there in Israel, even in the game, that's where most of the battles take place. It's kind of interesting. Now, of course, it's because of the way they set the board up. But... It's still interesting. You take a look at that stuff, and all that goes all the way back. Are there two seed lines that say, we're of Abraham? Yes. You're never going to have... Israel will never have peace until that kingdom comes. Yes. So don't be shocked when you see that. And I'm trying to explain that to this kid, and there's very little understanding, and, but... What we're, what we're looking at here is he says what? But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Don't get caught up in all the stuff outside. Don't go say, have you seen this? Have you heard this? Well, what about this? How about this thing? Where is it that we find someone that's faithful? Where is it that we find the ability to be stable? Where is it that we find a way for someone to keep you from evil? It's all the Scripture. Verse 4, And we have confidence. Where? In the Lord. Touching you that ye both do and will do the things which, he, which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the what? Patient, waiting, for Christ. He's, he's reminding them we still have that to look forward to. Amen. It's not gone. It's still, it's still a future for them. It's something that they have. Um, my clock's going way too fast. Go get, go get Romans chapter 8 real quick. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter five verse seven says what? Didn't know you're going to have a pop quiz, did you? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't we don't look at the world to try to figure out what God's doing. We look at the Scripture to find out what God's doing and take that to wherever we go. 
We don't, we don't get worried and concerned about all the stuff out there. The faith there has to do with trusting God's Word. And if God says something, then what do we do? We don't look at something else and say, yeah, but. We get to the Word and say, yeah, that's what it says. And how is that going to affect me? Verse 18, Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul's, Paul's reminding them some things because of who we are in Christ, because of our identification of who, who he's told us that we are in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, and 8, or 6, 7, and 8 here. Because we're justified in, in chapter 5, he says, here are some things, and I want to remind you of this. And he says, for I reckon, this is Paul saying, I count this to be true for myself, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. Why? For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of God, of reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Why? Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Why? For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also. That, that verse right there was hard for me. Because me growing up, some of you all know this and some don't, I grew up learning from Kenneth Copeland, Andrew Womack, and folks like that. And we didn't believe in divine healing. We believed in divine health, that you're never going to get sick. And when I read that verse and it says, for the whole creation groaneth and travaileth to, to get in pain together until now, that where he says in verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also. Of all the stuff that I learned growing up, what my dad taught me from Kenneth Copeland and all that stuff, that divine health was the toughest thing for me to let go of. That was the last straw that I was holding on to because I was told that's part of the salvation that you get. Because Christ, Christ died on the cross, we get divine health. And it was hard for me to make that, but that verse is the one that did it. And so then what I had to do is make a decision. Do I believe what, what my dad says or do I believe the verse? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, at the time, to go against your father's a tough thing to do when you're 20 years old. Because I don't know anything. And I don't, I'm not even saved until I get to 21. So having these things and thinking about this stuff, thinking back, at 21, I learned, I, I finally, for the first time, by the time I'm 21... I hear, the, I hear the gospel and I hear it and I trust it. And then I get into the scriptures and I'm, I'm having struggles because of all the stuff that I was taught. But this is what the verse says. And at that time, I didn't know how to reconcile those things. But through studying and reading, what I found out is, am I going to believe what my dad says or what the scripture says? And that verse right there tells me what? I'm not promised divine health. I'm promised what? Groaning, travailing, in pain. Why? Because I live in a sin-cursed world. But notice, and not only, our, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting. Waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. The greatest healing program ever, by the way. You think, about, you think about the ones that, that Christ healed. What happened to them? They died. What do they know that they have coming for them? 
They've got resurrection life. We talked about that last night. What do we find out here? Do we have that? Do we have redemption of our body to look forward to? Yes. Verse 24, For we are saved by what? Hope. That salvation, again, it's not salvation from hell. It's salvation from what? Thinking that the things that I'm going through in life is because God's putting this on me to try to get my attention, to get me back in gear, and get back in the Scriptures. That's not what it is. He, the, the issue here is what? When I look at those, those, those situations that I go through in life and I look at that and I say, the only reason I'm going through this is because I live in a sin-cursed world. It's not God punishing me. And I actually understand what's going on. He says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is, is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with what? Patience, wait for it. When we look at these things, this issue of the patience of hope, there's hope that we have, and we know that we have that, and what that's going to help produce is what? Patience. I look at that. I look forward to that day. I'm, I'm starting to get to the point where I, I need reading glasses. Um, Harry, we are at the family conference, and Harry's like, did I see you with reading glasses on? I said, yeah. He's like, so you are human. I was like, I've always been human. <laughs> but you see that stuff, and, you, and I'm starting, you start seeing that stuff, like, man, I can't wait for that. But it's not, I can't wait for that because I'd, I'll, be have, I'll be able to have perfect sight. It's not that I'm waiting for that because the bulges Brother Jordan was talking about last night. And you look at that stuff, what I, what I, there's times where you're like, Lord, come. But we don't look for that as an expectation that He comes to get us out of this. We look at it at rather as what? We get to go be with the Savior. Amen. We get to go be a part of the glory that is going to be revealed in us for His glory. To the praise and honor of His grace. That's what it's about. It's not an escape plan. It's a what? The greatest, the greatest, there's the word gone. Retirement. There we go. Came back here. The greatest retirement plan you can ever imagine. And God says, I've already given this to you. Wait for it. Now, go serve while you wait. Amen. And what happens is, is, we serve. We have that work of faith, labor of love, and the patience of hope. Letting the Word produce that in us. Don't get caught up in all the stuff out around us. Get back to the book. Let our focus be on where it needs to be. And that hope will give you comfort. Father, we thank you for the time that we have. As we continue this weekend, our goal is that we all come to your word and allow it to be the motivation. That we remind ourselves of the things that we have. That we cut off all the other stuff. And just go back to Philippians chapter 4 and keep our mind on those things that we should be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.